show your support and enter the competition. Simply follow, subscribe and comment. Hello, I am That British Guy and welcome to my review of the first ever NXT TakeOver Brooklyn show. Yes, because there is an NXT TakeOver show this month, uh, it gives me an opportunity to review one of the older TakeOver shows. Last time it was the first ever TakeOver show overall. And this, because this is going to be the last TakeOver Brooklyn, uh, kind of during SummerSlam, um, I thought it would be a fitting time to revisit the first one that they had there. Now, the show starts off with a very interesting kind of showpiece match. Tyler Breeze taking on Jushin Thunder Liger. Now this was a huge, momentous kind of occasion, um, obviously at the time, to see Jushin Thunder Liger in a WWE ring of any capacity. Um, it must have been kind of a, a huge honour for Tyler Breeze and kind of showed how he was viewed within WWE and the NXT brand as a whole at the time, which he kind of was. I mean, he was a former number one contender and had fought for the NXT title numerous times and had sort of big marquee matches up until this point. Um, unfortunately, he then kind of got moved up to the main roster and just lumbered in a kind of comedy tag team match. But at the time... Um, yeah, was was kind of seen as one of the biggest stars outside of the kind of title or the the immediate title picture. Um, and the match with Jushin Thunder Liger, yes, he is still very capable in the ring, but obviously given the, his age, um, Tyler was doing a lot of, I wouldn't say the heavy lifting as such, but he was certainly um, kind of making sure that he was putting over Liger as much as was physically possible um, throughout the match and really kind of showcasing him in front of the NXT and WWE crowd rather than the other way around because obviously people were perfectly aware of what Tyler Breeze could do in the middle of the ring so it was sort of his job to showcase Liger to a much bigger audience and I think at the time it was kind of, I think possibly the the assumption that this was going to become um, sort of a more common trend going forward. But unfortunately it kind of never quite um, came about, or at least it hasn't done yet. Um, I know at the moment the WWE are kind of doing more and more things with the likes of ICW and Progress over in the UK, especially because of the UK brand, and they are starting to do things um, over in Japan with um, Noah. So it might be something that sort of kickstarts in the next few months and years, um, but I, I think at the time it's something that by now they probably assumed would be much more commonplace than it is. Anyway, Liger obviously picked up the win here because, of course, he had to. You can't invite this guy into your company and then kind of not put him over. Um, but it was a very, very hot opener. And it's a real shame that this we're still sort of waiting for the culmination of, of this going forward, really. Next up, we had the tag team title um, match the Vaude Villains um, taking on Blake and Murphy. Um, and the story behind this was the fact that Blake and Murphy had Alexa Bliss on their side and she was really kind of the difference maker in um, their matches with all, all comers really. Um, was able to kind of distract the referee, um, introduce weapons for Blake and Murphy to use in order to win their matches. Um, and it was kind of up to the Vaude villains to kind of neutralise her in order to make sure that the playing field was level and that they would f be able to kind of finally knock off Blake and Murphy. And they did this with the use of Blue Pants, who was around for a while at the time um, and kind of then disappeared not long after this actually. and hasn't been seen since I mean she's still working the uh, the indies um, under uh, 
Leah something name on screen um, and yeah was was kind of brought in for leveling the playing field as I said and, and obviously did that uh, job perfectly not getting involved until was absolutely necessary at the end um, in order for the board villains to win the tag team titles now watching this match back it's quite clear to see why Blake and Murphy kind of never really properly became a thing and it's also quite clear to see why Alexa Bliss very much did um, everything about that trio was kind of all about her her presence her personality her involvement she was the thing that kind of made them anything really um, so watching this back it's really not a shock to see how she was kind of then able to take over Smackdown um, like she did in 2016 and then take over Raw in 2017 when she moved over to Raw and kind of still is up until this point um, off of this really um, obviously Buddy Murphy is now kind of finding his feet again on 205 Live but it's not really the same calibre and Blake is well nowhere to be seen is he so it, it's not surprising looking back at these sorts of matches and if this was commonplace at the time then um, it's kind of very easy to see why that is the case Next up, we had um, Apollo Crews' debut match against a heel, Ty Dillinger, um, still kind of under the Perfect Ten moniker, but in the kind of arrogant, I'm perfect and no one else is on my level kind of um, side of it, really, uh, which obviously, like most heel characters, ends up kind of transcending the that heel side of things, going kind of back round to the beginning again and kind of getting over with the crowd as a face. Um, not really too much to say about this match. Uh, the crowd seemed genuinely excited to see the debut of Apollo Crews and he put on a good kind of showcase in this match. Um, very athletic, um, showing his sort of strength and his power. Um, but, I mean, it's it's what he did here was every match that he kind of still performs on Raw he seems to have obviously some sort of set formula that he sticks to the whole time his character hasn't developed in any way since um, and it certainly wasn't that clear from this debut to see what his character actually was um, it is a bit of shame what sort of happened to Ty Dillinger since but looking at this it's it's another kind of name that's just not really done anything on the main roster and I mean looking back at these three matches you've got Tyler Breeze who is nowhere really um, had an opportunity I suppose where him and Fandango probably should have been Smackdown Tag Team Champions uh, last year round about sort of this time or autumn last year and that never came to fruition You've got the Vaude Villains where Aiden English is a lackey for Rusev who should be more over than he is but they don't seem to want to be pushing him um, and obviously Simon Gotch has been released. Murphy is on 205 Live, um, Blake has been released and Alexa Bliss is the star of the women's division um, but not sort of featuring in this match really as a competitor and then you've got Apollo Crews doing nothing on Raw and Ty Dillinger doing nothing on Smackdown um, not kind of a good look for the future um, for when you're on NXT really it's sort of alright at the time and then you become a very small fish in a very big pond the next match is Samoa Joe facing off against Baron Corbin and this is kind of um, it's a bit odd because both characters are heel characters even though Samoa Joe was very much a crowd favourite because he hadn't been around for very long um, at this point um, so was kind of still riding high on that um, well that sort of pop from the beginning really um, from, from the, his debut 
um, and it was kind of an unofficial number one contenders type match, kind of setting up the person to kind of go up to the next level um, once the main event had kind of been taken care of um, and just to kind of see what the top of the card of NXT would become in the months to follow. Obviously Samoa Joe then went on to become the first ever two-time NXT champion um, and Baron Corbin mm. Although, obviously, he never became champion in NXT, he was given the Money in the Bank briefcase last year, and obviously things didn't go too well, and his new Constable character is kind of trying to gain some traction, but feels a bit, meh, not really sure. Um, so, quite what happens with that going forward... I feel like he kind of just needs to abuse his power a bit more. But in this match, it was well worked between the two of them. Sort of power versus power. And really, uh, sort of, Joe's experience being the difference maker between the two of them here. Um, being able to win at his first um, takeover show. Um, and then use this kind of as a step up to move him up into the main event, sort of, number one contendership caliber of stars within NXT which of course he was going to move into anyway given the history that he's had um, at places like TNA and Ring of Honor beforehand it was only natural and he was probably the first sort of big in named indie star guy really that they they'd got in a long time um, and also hadn't tried to then completely repackage and rename he was just brought in as Samoa Joe and was able to continue as Samoa Joe obviously they did the same going forward with the likes of Shinsuke Nakamura and Bobby Roode and Adam Cole and those sorts of guys um, but this was probably the first of, of that ilk because um, even when they brought in uh, Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose obviously they brought them in, renamed them, repurposed them ever so slightly for um, NXT and WWE, whereas Joe was kind of brought in as is and just let loose effectively. Next up we have the women's title match um, and this was kind of really the showcase of the entire show. It was the feud and storyline that was sort of the main feature going in it was i'm surprised it wasn't the main event to be honest obviously after this um at the next takeover show they had an iron woman match 30 minute iron woman match which did actually headline the show um but seeing what D uh, bailey and sasha can do in the ring together um it, it just it's a real shame that we're not getting that up on the main roster now and that we've got them tagging after showing that kind of dissension and finally possibly getting some kind of payoff from what was nearly a year ago that storyline started with the, the tensions between them to see them then kind of work it out and just join back up as a tag team after two weeks of therapy is a bit pathetic to be honest. It would have been nice to have that as a kind of a second singles woman's feud going on at the moment. Again, kind of unofficially crowning a number one contender for when the winner of that feud kind of then moves into a title program. Not necessarily then winning the belt, but just using that story to propel one of them to back towards the belt. Um, because this was basically Bailey's crowning moment within it. In NXT, um, she finally, as the uh, the underdog, they kind of played it out perfectly. The amount of time she had come, sort of this close to winning, um, and never quite managing to. I think they played it just to the right level, and before it, then got too ridiculous. And it probably was predictable at the time that she was going to finally win the big one on this huge stage it was effectively like the wrestlemania of nxt which to be honest is what brooklyn has kind of become the the show at uh, wrestlemania never feels anywhere near as big in nxt as it does um, around SummerSlam time um and this was sort of one of the matches 
and probably the match that really helped cement this show and this um, this kind of whole spectacle as the main event of NXT really um, and kind of give them a home in the Barclays Centre and yeah as I said it might have been predictable but sometimes predictable is good um, and certainly if Sasha had won this match that would have killed any kind of credibility and momentum that Bailey would have had. Sasha didn't lose anything um, by losing this match. She was already featuring on the main roster anyway with Becky Lynch and Charlotte um, and was actually at the SummerSlam the day after this in a um, nine woman kind of triple threat tag match um, with Team Bad who were actually at ringside here to watch her um, but yeah as I said the story was all about Bailey finally being able to overcome the odds even with her injured hand that Sasha had worked over Bailey was finally able to win the belt and then we got that brilliant moment in the middle of the ring with all four women um, even Sasha sort of raising Bailey's hand effectively um, big hugs between Charlotte and Becky and, and Bailey and Sasha in the middle of the ring kind of solidifying now we have done what we've needed to do this was the first step in sort of putting credible women's wrestling back on the map um, we've done it in NXT, um, we've kind of handed the baton over to Bailey to kind of keep that rolling in NXT while we move up to the main roster and kind of make sure that it, it gets across there as well and when she has done her job here she will join us and we'll be able to carry on doing this as a four. It's just a shame that kind of, it's sort of working but it's not if you like because now they've obviously brought in Asuka and kind of killed her dead in the, on the main roster they've had to bring in Ronda Rousey um, although Alexa Bliss has dominated the women's division she's kind of done it not being the best performer although she's certainly been sort of one of the best promos um, in the company so at least there's sort of character to her um, but sort of other than her, it's it's basically been Charlotte and a bit of Sasha. Um, hopefully, going forward, Bailey is able to replicate this sort of thing because this is what she should have had then again at WrestleMania 33, when she should have beaten Charlotte Flair in a one-on-one -on -one match for the Raw Women's Title. Then instead of being her on a random episode of Raw and then retaining the belt against her at fast lane in a weird kind of way and then having that four way match with Sasha, Charlotte and Nia Jax. But that's done now and we just gotta live with it. But at least we can still go back to this show and this match. The only issue with this match was then the beginning of the next match, the ladder match between Finn Balor and Kevin Owens for the NXT title it took them a good 10-15 minutes no 8-10 minutes to kind of warm the crowd back up again because they seemed like they were absolutely spent after the Bailey sasha match because they were so invested in that storyline and the characters and the match itself and right from the first bell they were kind of in the palm of their hands for the entire match and yeah it took a little while for them to kind of get back into things um, which was a shame because there was nothing wrong with the match at all um, there wasn't as much kind of investment in it it Kevin Owens had already featured um, up on the main roster and had um, a bit of a feud with John Cena he'd lost the belt at Beast in the East to um, to Finn Balor and this was really his kind of rematch to get that out of the way move him up onto the main roster permanently um, and kind of vacate that heel uh, challenger um, position for um, Samoa Joe to sort of move up into that in time and then finally dethrone Finn Balor but this was 
I think if this had probably come before the women's match, would have probably got a better reaction at the beginning. As I said, the crowd did get into it by the end, uh, mainly because of the fact that Kevin Owens has absolutely no care, it seems, for his own health and well-being, um, and puts himself in any kind of harm's way for um, entertainment, and Finn Balor is kind of more than equal to that as well. Um, coming out as the demon as well which kind of gets gives that extra sort of pop from the crowd um, that extra kind of excitement and anticipation and back then his mannerisms and his way of wrestling was slightly different um, when he donned the makeup as the demon and really when you're getting a coup de gras off the top of the ladder as well towards the end of the match you can't really go wrong with that kind of felt sorry for Finn's knees and his ankles and obviously Kevin Owens as well for having to receive it as safely as possible um, but what I will say is fair credit to the guys for actually getting the crowd back involved in it because they could have quite easily got disheartened with that and just thought you know what nuts to this let's just kind of wrestle a bog standard match get it over and done with get the show over and just get the hell out of here but they persevered they kept on they heightened the the drama and just the recklessness of the whole thing got the crowd back involved got them back reinvested in it and kind of sent them home happy at the end with a Finn Balor victory in the what was the only the second ever NXT ladder match and funnily enough the other one was for the main belt as well so all in all the show had I wouldn't say it had one particularly sort of bad match in the Apollo tie match, just really because there was nothing going in, because obviously it was Apollo Crews' first match um, and was pretty paint by numbers in terms of the match that it was. The tag match was not too bad. Um, it wasn't the hottest of hot matches going in, but the, the whole kind of manager's acting uh, around sort of the outside of the ring as well kind of added an extra layer to it which was quite nice um, the Samoa Joe Baron Corbin match was okay um, certainly wasn't sort of Samoa Joe's standout matches within uh, NXT but at the time Baron Corbin wasn't anywhere near as good as he even is now he's really developed in the last sort of year 18 months um, but was kind of adequately brutal in this match. The Tyler Breeze and Liger match was a brilliant opener, um, and it's a shame they don't do that sort of thing more. Um, the ladder match was very, very good, and as I said, fair play to the guys for bringing the crowd in, but really, e even if you're only going to watch one match on this show, you need to watch the Bailey sasha Banks match. It had everything it needed going in. You got an excellent match out of the two of them. Wrestled nigh on perfectly by both of them as well. Um, and the right outcome. And then it led to um, them having the um, Iron Woman match. The 30 minute Iron Woman match. Uh, just a few months later. Which arguably was an even better match. Than, than that. Um, and it's just a shame we don't get to see that. Sort of at the moment. On the main roster. But as I said. At least we still have this match here. So yes. They were my thoughts on NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 1. Um, overall. It's a shame that some of the mid-matches were kind of there, really. Um, it, it just felt like there wasn't enough stakes for them. They were just kind of there, which sort of was a, a, a thing with um, earlier TakeOver shows. Uh, NXT kind of put all their stock in just the title matches or one sort of blood feud. But they were like, mm, we kind of need a couple of extra matches just to sort of fatten out this card a bit so we'll just sort of chuck these bits in here so um but the good matches that we got those three the the opener and the two closing matches were superb matches and it's worth 
at least seeing those three or as I said, if you're just going to see the one, watch the Bailey Sasha match because it was neon perfect. Um, and looking back at it, I'm not quite sure what else they could have done in order to turn that into a five star match because it did technically only get a 4.75. But again, that's sort of one man's opinion, if you like. Um, next time, when we're um, in November for the next TakeOver show that we have, I will be doing another classic TakeOver review, and that will be, because I am that British guy, I will be looking at NXT TakeOver London. But until then, I have been that British guy, and I will see you very soon.